Hey, what up fam? Kevin here. I hope you're continuing to do well uh, with all the news of this shelter in place extension. I just want you to know that we are praying for you so much. And uh, we just pray that, uh, that the God of all comfort is with you during this chaotic, uncertain season. And so uh, I hope you're doing well. I want to tell you about uh, something I'm really excited about as we head into a new set of, of lessons. We're going to go away from the topical side of things and go really into uh, a study of a book. And I'm really excited about it. And uh, there's some cool ways that you can interact during this. And so um, we're going to start off by going through an exercise together uh, today. And uh, you're, if you're watching this in your small groups, your small group leader is going to pause it and give you the opportunity to take as much time as you need to participate. If you're watching this on your own, I would encourage you, uh, as the instructions pop up on the screen, just hit pause on YouTube and, uh, and just participate. And this can only help you in the study that we're going through. So... Uh, we're going to be diving into the book of James. It's one of my favorite passages, or one of my favorite books of the Bible, just because uh, James is someone that tells it how it is. And I, I just love the matter-of-factness about this book. Um, I remember studying it my senior year of high school and always leaving, telling people that, yeah, uh, God just slapped me across the face with his word because it's just so good. It's just There's so much meat to, to go through. And so... Uh, we're going to do this thing um, where, where we're going to try to break down the passage and give you an opportunity to wrestle with Scripture before you even hear anything else from my voice or your small group leader's voice or any questions. And hopefully you're able to use these things uh, as a tool to help in your discussions moving forward. And so I'm going to ask you to pull out a pen or a paper and uh, we're going to get into it. And so... Um, you're also going to need your Bible, whether it be on your phone or, or an actual physical Bible, which if you don't have a physical Bible, please let us know. I'd love to buy you one. So uh, let me know on that. And we're going to dive in. We're going to be in James chapter 1, and we're going to be starting in verse 2, and we're going to be going all the way to verse 12. And so the first thing we're going to do together is we're going to write out the passage. And when we do this, I want us to read the passage I want us to read it once, twice, three times. In fact, I, 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 would, I would ask that you would read the passage in different translations. Read it slowly. Go, go line by line, uh, word by word, and, and, and just read it and study it for, for a few minutes. And then I'm going to ask you to write it out. And it might seem like kind of strange, like, no, these aren't, uh, you know, standards as a punishment in school, which I've had to do on occasion. Uh, but this is just an idea where we put we, we take what we're listening to and we put it on paper and it's just another way for our brain to recognize what we are studying. And so and also it's going to give us an opportunity to circle and highlight any observations that come up and that's going to be in the next step. So take the next couple minutes and write out the passage on the piece of paper. All right great now that you've done that uh, we're going to move on to the next section uh, of, of our study uh, portion of this and, and and I want you to to look at the passage you just wrote down and, and I'm going to ask you to break it down I'm going to ask you to find uh, observations and, and and ask questions based off the passage that you're reading look at it verse by verse look at it word by word I want you to write down any questions that pop up or any observations that come to mind as you're breaking down this passage and it doesn't need to be this long process probably a couple minutes um and if you're confused or you, you're like, I don't know what to be looking for, I added a few questions down below that, that you can go through. I won't read all of them because they'll be on the screen, but are there words or phrases that are repeated? Uh, are there any similes, metaphors, hyperboles, illustrations, etc.? What emotions or images come to mind when you read this passage? These are the things that, uh, this is the place where God really meets us where we're at and, and really pulls out the things that he wants us to hear from him in a situation like this when we're taking and looking at observations and questions. So take the next couple minutes and do that. But now with all that insight in mind, I, I want you to look at the passage and, and think about what's, what's the interpretation 
of the passage. In other words, ask yourself, what is the passage saying? Or what is the main idea? It doesn't need to be this paragraph, but maybe a, a, a sentence or two of a description of, hey, when I think about this passage, when I break it down in chunks, the, the main idea I get from this, so the point that I think God is trying to get across is this. And, and I want to caution you here because the temptation is going to be to write out what you think the, the passage means to you. Right? You're going to have this temptation to write down your application to it. But I want, you, I, want, I want you to kind of push against that. And I want you to think about the context in which this passage is being written. So go ahead, write a couple sentences down of what you think uh, the main idea of the passage is. And then I will share the last part with you after that. All right, so now that we've gone through all these parts, right? We've, we've gone through all the, these things. We, we just asked ourselves, what's the main idea of the passage. And so I want to take that, that thrust of that question and I want to apply it here because in this section we're going to talk about the application process, right? How does this passage call me to respond? What is God calling me to do based off of the passage that I wrote out today? And I want to encourage you to, I want you to feel, like if you're feeling like, man, I, I, I don't have a lot or man, I really didn't, nothing came to mind when uh, you ask that question. Don't. This is not a test. This is. You will not be graded by this. Uh, this is between you and the Lord, and 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 hopefully your small group when you share these things with them. But this is not uh, a place to have these. I mean, there might be some epiphanies, but it's not uh, a place where if you didn't write down, then you're less of a of a Christian or whatever. This is just a time for us to to open up the Word and study it in a different way. And so ask yourselves, how does this call me to respond? Maybe there's some action steps. Maybe it's just, hey, you know what? I really need to pray about this area of my life. Or, hey, maybe I really need to turn from, from some things in my life that I'm really struggling with. But when we think of applications, I want to encourage you, be as specific and tangible as possible and think through one or two people that you can bring into the fold so that they can keep you accountable to the application steps that you have set into place. And so uh, I'm going to give you a chance to, to write those down, and then we are going to get into our lesson today. All right, guys, hey, go ahead and take that piece of paper and put it off to the side. Uh, you will be able to uh, reference that during your small group discussion time. Hopefully during this, uh, this lesson time, maybe I'll answer a few of the questions or shed light on some of the observations that you made, uh, and you can bring those insights into your small group discussion and, uh, and I hope that it's a blessing to you. This is something that I do personally uh, on occasion when I want to really study scripture because I have the attention span of, of an acorn and my brain just goes a thousand different places. And if I have a set thing that I have to do, it really keeps me focused. And so I hope that it's a blessing to you as well. So like I said, we're, we're diving into a series on the book of James and I'm really excited about it because James just tells it how it is. And sometimes in life, we just need someone to tell us how it is, you know, and sometimes we just need someone to be real with us. And even if it, even if it hurts, even if we don't necessarily agree with it, sometimes we're just like, hey, just at least just be honest with me. And James does a very good job of being honest with us. And I re remember studying this, uh, this passage, this book for the first time my senior year and just changing my perspective on a lot of things because he just gets right to it. And so we're going to join him and get right into it. Before we uh, dive into the passage itself, I want, to, I want to give us a little bit of context of what we're talking about here, because I think context is key. It's important. It's something that we, we need to do uh, so that we can uh, gain greater insight on what the author is trying to say. And so James, if you don't know, is the, uh, is the brother of Jesus. And for your uh, 15 point jeopardy question the book of james was actually written five years after the death and resurrection of jesus and it's one of the first books written of the of the new testament so don't let the placement of the book fool you on that and all that all that means when i think about that is that this is this is semi-fresh in james's mind right this is this not only is he related to jesus so he saw him die and so that's got to have some kind of effect on him but the impact that he had on, on, on the world, but him specifically, had to have been huge. 
because they grew up together and uh, they, they did all these things. And you could think of good things that happened in life five years ago and you could probably put great detail behind those things. And so James has a good foundation, a background, an understanding of what he's talking about because he lived it. And in the in not so far distant past, he lived it. And the last context piece I want to give you is is to to look at the audience of of who the author is writing the book to because it really helps us understand uh, parts of what um, of what he's trying to get across if we know the the audience members that he is trying to communicate with. And in this scenario, in verse one of this of this book of chapter one, it says that it's written to the 12 tribes. And this is just Christians scattered throughout the world. Unfortunately, in this situation, Christians are in a very chaotic and uncertain time of, of real persecution, of real death, where people like Saul uh, is going around killing Christians for what they believe. Because at that point, the Sanhedrin are trying to gain control and, and, and legitimacy and insight uh, back into the culture and the community. And the best way to do that is to get rid of the Jesus followers because they were able to do that. And so they're trying to gain influence back. And that's how they were doing it. And so James is trying to encourage them in the midst of this chaotic, crazy season. And, and that's the context in which we find ourselves going into the passage today. And I title our lesson today, The Life of Discipleship. And I think it's important that we, we name it that because we, I want us to, to realize that James is about to lay out these very clear steps to us on what an apprentice of Jesus really looks like. And I want to stop there because there are many different ways that we can apprentice Jesus and become like him in likeness and in character. Right? There, are, there are many ways for us to do that. Um, there, there, there are ways for us to do that in his word. There's ways for us to do that through prayer, through community. Um, but James is going to dive into a, a specific way that we quickly grow in his likeness and character. Uh, and that's through, through trial and, and chaos and uncertainty. But he's really going to give us a, a, a big step-by-step -step understanding of how we can help in that process and how we can uh, really be uh, the, the initiators of that process. And so I'm going to dive in and I'm going to read a few of the passages that we're going to touch on and then I'll send you off to your small group. So starting in verse 2, it says this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may not make that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Say steadfastness five times fast. Oh my goodness. Okay. Uh, so the first thing I want to point out is is starting right in the right in verse two. He he says very clearly, consider it joy. And and the joy co comes uh, the reasons in which we consider things joy come right after that. But I want to focus on that word joy. For a second, not only is it on my wonderful hat, shout out Chris Du, but uh, I think it's important that James lays it out that way, because I think sometimes we can equate happiness and joy together, and they are two completely different things. Because happiness is circumstantial, right? Think of moments in time that you that you were happy, and they usually are around some really great moment, right? I think of of uh, of my nine ten year old baseball all-star team that won on a walk-off single to go to the state championship tournament, right? That was circumstantial. If we would have lost that game, if the, if the roles would have been flipped, that would not have been a happy moment, right? But joy is not based on circumstance. Joy surpasses circumstance. It doesn't matter, right? That's why the person that's lost their job, the Christian that's lost their job because of COVID-19 can still find joy in the midst of of their suffering because their joy, their happiness lies far beyond what the world can provide them, right? It's those moments where you say, well, at least I have God, or at least, at least I know that Jesus is with me. Those kinds of things that we say, it's because that's, that's joy. That's true joy. That's not circumstantial. It's not based on circumstantial. It's based on what we know in our faith and how God has shown up and shown out in our lives in the past. And so that's that. And it says that we are to, to consider it joy when we face trials of many kinds. 
I think this is this is uh, this is something we need to think about because it's not just a specific kind of trial. It's this trials of many kinds. And when I read this, uh, the fact comes to me is as Christians, we are going to face trial. Our faith is going to be tested. In fact, every single day that we live on this earth, our faith is tested. And for those of us that are heading to college, our seniors, our juniors, or if you're preparing for that, you are going to be challenged. Your faith is going to be challenged like you've never been challenged before. And it's in those moments that we start to learn about who, where our foundation lies, where our trust and faith lies. Is it in ourselves? Is it in other people? Or is it in the, in the God of the universe that created you, that loves you, and that wants the best for you? And so it says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. And it's interesting because should we, should we even be happy about trials? Like, should we even, should, like, how do we even do that? Well, the fact of the matter is, no, we should not like trials. But the fact of the matter is, when sin entered the world, the perfect scenario that God created was broken. Because God's original design was perfection. There was no trial. And we were promised when we take our last breath on this earth and enter into eternity... We are promised in scripture that there is no more pain, no more trial, no more tears. It's perfection. And so should we be happy about trials? Absolutely not. Because they suck. But I believe what James is trying to help us realize is one, they're a part of, they're a part of the, the discipleship journey. But two, there's a way to reorient how we see trials in life to really help us as we pursue Jesus and grow in his likeness and his character. And it's this. Sometimes when we, when we go through trial, we look at it and it's like, oh, this is just a punishment for the mistakes and the sins that I've done in my life, right? I went out and I partied or I did this bad thing with my boyfriend or girlfriend or I looked at a thing on the internet and now bad things are happening be in, because of that, right? We look at it that way as this cost analysis thing. Or we look at it and we look at God and like, why are you doing this to me? We think that he's picking on us like a bully. But the fact of the, of the matter is that James is trying to show us that this is an opportunity. This is not a, a, an opportunity to, to look down on ourselves or to look at God and say, what are you doing? But it's an opportunity for us to look at the situation and say, wow, God is, is using this as an opportunity to grow me in, in our relationship. That it's, it's going to be a way that, that I'm going to be a better, that I'm going to be a more understanding believer because I'm going to grow in, in likeness and character to Jesus through this trial that's going to take place. Is it going to be fun? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But in those moments when we come to a place like, man, God's going to grow me through this. And it's probably not a right immediate thing. But when we get to that place, when we can reflip and reorient ourselves to think that way, it changes our whole understanding. And it, and it leads us to seek wisdom in that. Because trials are hard and, and, and uncertainty and chaos and, and testing is going to happen, right? Because of, of sin and its, and its effect on the world. But I want to tell you this, that bad experiences aren't wasted experiences, right? That nothing in this life is ever wasted by God. Nothing in this life is ever wasted by God. Does God allow these things to happen? No, because in the beginning, we, we know that God want, created us to be in perfect relationship with him. But because of sin and its effect on the world, bad things happen. But God in his mercy and his love and his grace takes those bad things, those effects of the fall, and he uses them for good. And it means that bad experiences aren't wasted experiences because nothing is wasted in this life by God. But how we handle those experiences, how we handle those trials, how we handle the bad things that happen in life, truly define the impact that it will have on us moving forward and impact the foundation that we lay for the next time that bad things or trials come to our life. And that brings me back to verse 5 through 8. And it says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, unstable in all his ways. See, straight to the point, real. That's James for you. But here's the, here's the good news in all this. 
that God wants us to understand him, right? That God wants us to understand him. In fact, he, he wants us to, to, to come to him in this time. He wants us to know that he is there with us. He wants us to, to, to gain understanding of why we're, we're doing the things we're, we're doing. That being said, we are finite human beings that cannot understand a God that is outside of time and space. So there are things that we just aren't going to understand. But the things that we can understand, God wants us and asks us to, to, to ask for those things, to seek wisdom, to, to invite him in to the things that we're going through. Because God does not want us to walk through chaos and uncertainty on our own. In fact, he gives us multiple avenues to do that, like I said before. This reminds me of a story. We're, we're teaching Landon how to ride a bike right now, right? And from the moment I push him off to start riding, there is immediate chaos and uncertainty going on. Imagine the things going through a young child's head, or if you remember even learning how to ride a bike, the things are going on in your brain as you're trying to do this, right? You're trying to pedal, you're trying to brake, you're trying to uh, survey your surroundings, you're trying to listen to the instructions from from the person that's helping, all these different things. But as his father, you know what I do right before I send him off? This is what I do. I look him in the eye and I, said this, and I say this, all right, buddy, remember, I am going to be with you every step of the way. If you need anything, I'll be right beside you. You got this. And I give him a push and he goes off on his way knowing that I am right there beside him. Notice I didn't say, hey, bud, good luck, push him. And say, if you need anything, turn around, come back, I'll be on the porch, let me know. That's not how I did it. I was with him. I entered into his chaos and his uncertainty, even having to run sometimes to keep up with this fast-paced person and to be there. And God is the same way. He enters into our mess. He says, I want to be there with you. I'm, I'm walking beside you. And that's so amazing that God does that. He does that from the very beginning when he creates us to be in a relationship with him, that he wants to be with us, he enters into it. He enters into our situation when he sends Jesus to die on the cross for us and to, to, to solidify that relationship. And then he enters into the re relationship when we enter into eternity, when we take our final breath on this earth. He's always with us every step of the way and we should take comfort in that. And the whole passage culminates with this verse, uh, with this pa verse in, 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 tw in 12. And it says this, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. Notice that he didn't say, blessed is the one that remains perfect under trial. This is important to understand because we are called to make an attempt on this. The next right step, we are called to say, hey, I recognize that I'm going through trial and I want to reach out to Jesus. I want to reach out to God and say, I want to enter into this with you. So we're called to make an attempt. We are called to honor God in the way that we do things, and, and it's not gonna be perfect. And I wanna end with this, because I think it's important. I read this, and I, and I think it's really, really cool. And it says this, as James has already shown us, and will further extrain, explain, authentic faith deals with affliction by persevering, ever clinging to Christ in the midst of trial. And as we do this, we begin to grow in his likeness and his character. When people see us, they start to see Jesus in us and not ourselves trying to figure it out on our own. And so what are the ways that you are ever clinging to Christ in the midst of the uncertainty, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the trials that will come? Those are the, these are the things you're going to dive into in your small groups today. So Anchor Fam, I hope you're doing well. I love you guys. I miss you guys. If you have any questions when I hop into your small group uh, tonight, please let me know and I, I hope to answer them. And, uh, and I will see you later. Peace.